Hello everybody, right around Australia, Championship Series NBL Overtime. I'm excited, so well you should be. Melbourne United 1, Tasmania 0, but we've got Game 2 Friday night in beautiful Tassie. Hobart's going to be rocking. The ambassador's in the house, Leonard Kaplan. Man, how you doing? You. Are you going to Tassie? I'm not going this week. I'm going to be there for Game 4. Okay, is yes. there going to be a Game 4? Of course there's going to be a Game All right, 4. That's what I want to hear. Are you calling a sweep? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I want to see five games. You feeling good? Feeling good. Good. Liam Santa Maria, hello to you. Hello, man. How cool is Grand Final Week in Championship Series? Yeah, it's great. Geez, we arrived there kind of quickly, right? Like, uh, obviously, those two series went to three games, but then all of a sudden, bam, Grand Final Championship Series is underway. We didn't even get a chance to give any predictions or anything. One game down, and here we are. All right, let's get into it, because it was a wonderful Sunday afternoon in Melbourne. The joint was humming. Tasmania off the back of that big win in Perth. But Melbourne were... Brilliant. Shaley, big JLA, we'll get to that very shortly. Their ability after quarter time to be able to find an open man, Luke Travers. Bowen came off the bench. Dalla has got that championship experience. Liam, it was just fun to watch, and then this guy went to work. Yeah, he really did. Look, it was a taking care of business type of win for Melbourne United. Uh, first game of the series on your home floor. You've got to come out and flex your muscle and really just get that, get that done. And... Um, it was the team, the high-quality team that has been on top of the table all season that has not lost two games in a row. And, um, you yeah, know, they put the clamps on them at a crucial point in the game and they took that thing away. Emotions were high, you know, and they got so much talent. Look, their starting five is probably the most talented team in the league. But then they got guys that come off the bench who are very, just as talented, you probably start for anybody, Clark and those guys. But Travis was special for me. His IQ, mm -hmm. the way he played defense. Della Vadova, who's been doing it all year long. But then when you let Golden get going, I don't care what you say. When he gets going, <laughs> you're probably going to lose, Liam. It is what it is. Quick shout out Anthony Dremick, just for keeping yes, that thing yes, alive yes, for a, a hot little minute. Really? But you're right. Golden, Clark, Travis, um, Nelly. Joe Lawala, Chul, a bunch of guys stepped up. They're deep. They were great. But I want to start with this because you have been continually on it. For the most of the month of January and into February, that the defensive intensity that Melbourne United was so great at early in the year had dropped away a little bit. And you'd questioned if they were going to be able to get back to it. It looked like it was back on Sunday. Yeah, 100%. And, I, and go, let's go back even further. And we were at the very start of the season. We were saying this team has a place that they can go defensively that I didn't, th I didn't think any team either can match or can handle. And if they go there... Uh, at any point, then they can really grab a hold of a game. They went to that point late in game one against mm -hmm. Illawarra and they marched their way back from 16 down and got that win. And they went to it again here midway through the second quarter of game one. That It sparked a 12-zip run and, you know, plays like this where they jump into the passing lane and they run away and throw it down in transition. They locked them up, Cam, they did. during this stretch of time and they got grabbed hold of the game. Well, I just, just want to go back to Wednesday. That was huge. JLA was as energetic as I've seen him for a little while. And they're all over the joint. And when you've got someone like this who's so lengthy and can go the other way in Travers, it's a, it's a huge bonus. But the, the Wednesday night game three against Illawarra, they were so good defensively. The game was, you know, between 10 and 12 points. And Ian Clark comes off the bench. Their ability to swarm here is amazing. They just never felt like Illawarra could get enough momentum to steal the win mm. in Game 3, even though the scoreboard said a certain thing. And that's what I felt on Sunday, Coach. Yeah. Now, I know the scoreboard didn't necessarily suggest. I think even halfway through the third quarter, it was in single figures. As yep. Ian Clark buzzer beat it, it probably was a dagger. But you know they are at their best defensively when there's no confidence people watching the game. The other team can conjure up any major run to win a finals game. Well, I think it starts with Shea Ely. I mean, and it's been like that for the last couple of years. When he starts up and in, letting you know, guys behind me, I'm going to pick these guys up. And, and, and then you got Travis, who's at long and athletic. Mm -hmm. And you got Della Vadova. So Dean Fickman has gone out and, and grabbed three or four of the best defensive guys in the league mm -hmm. who can also score, but their main focus is shedding people down. Yeah, And, and when, you, when you can do that, you know, you, you, you're probably you going to win. You're bang on. Illy, Daly, um, Ian Clark, those guys on the perimeter, right? Yeah. So they run Tazzy off the three-point line. I shot 44% Tazzy from three-point territory, but they didn't get enough up because right. they pushed him out off the three-point line, turned him into drivers. Why? Because you've got elite rim protection yep. waiting for him at the cup. Joe Luala Chul, Ariel Hook Porty. Travis. Luke Travis, who had four blocks. So what they do defensively all came to fruition in that game in a big moment to kick off a championship series, and they won by 20. Yep. So defensively, they were brilliant. Yep. 
And Chris Golding was brilliant as well. We've seen him do this in great, in, in major moments, not just for a Melbourne United jersey, but also for Australia. But when he does this, Liam Santa Maria, mm. when he's in this mood, which is traditionally attached to a big game, it's fun to watch and it traditionally breaks the heart. How he gets that to go barely touching the net yeah. is incredible. <laughs> well, this is the Chris Golding we watched for most of the first time. This one was crazy. The step back here on, on uh, Magna. And then he was just... So locked in now, he's shooting it from well beyond NBA territory, and he's just got the swagger too, like it ain't no thing, right? And it had shades of the first half of the season, yes. It also had shades. Let's go back to game five of the 2018 grand final series. Yeah, Drew, and, Drew said it before when you start making those faces, that's when you know he's feeling <laughs> it. And, and you, whoever he's playing against, you can't let him see the rim the first time mm. or the second time, and it goes in. His confidence is sky high. He's, a, he's the best shooter in this league by so, far. So, and the thing is, too, they do a really good job and an even better job now than they had in the last year or so mm -hmm. to be able to get him those shots. Mm -hmm. I think there was times last year with the makeup of the team that he wasn't getting shots as many as he should, or at mm -hmm. least when he's in the flow of it. He, he seems like he's smarter than he's ever been. He's obviously uh, in ripping form. And we've said this the whole time, so this is nothing new. When he goes, Melbourne United go. And it's not just on court, it's off court as well. And you can feel it in the arena. Mm. The joint's humming. Mm. And that's exactly what Sunday was. He, he was three votes for me. I know I'm not in voting. Our man Olgan is this. But he was three votes for me in that game, mm -hmm. the Larry Sankstock medal. Because if, you know, if Golding shoots like that, Melbourne are going to win. And Absolutely. It's the, it's the focus for... It's just like showing down Bryce Cotton. It's the focus for every team playing against Melbourne United is, man, we've got to get... Uh, keep Chris Golding under wraps. We can't have him do what he ended up doing because if he does, we're probably going to lose. Well, was Tazzy bad on defense by letting him get uh, make six threes? He got off ten threes. Oh. To make six threes, somebody's not doing their job. I, I, he, it was he just that well, good. I, 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 That's I, tough shots. Yeah. Tough shots. Like, what more could Will Magne do in that in that clip that Liam spoke of? Like he literally just backpedaled to a three, and you got a great defender mm -hmm. whose length. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like in the end, once he gets going, the, the defense is almost. Irrelevant. That, yeah. that first look, though, in the corner on that right corner was the one. You talk about letting him get him going early. No, 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 not that not one. In, one. Not that far corner. Oh, this one here. The corner yeah, in a semi-transition. Yeah. That, that, is, that is right. Yeah. Jeez, like when, you, when you're catching it from there and you've got a hand in your wow. face, it's just That's like, when you feel it. You're in a zone. You it happens. Do. All right, Will Magne, because yeah. uh, Tech Fair, you've been in this moment. You've been in a mm. moment. The emotions are higher. Sensitivities. We know what it feels like in game one of a grand final series. Part of that 12 run, a 12 0 run was a Tech Fair and Will Magne. Okay, so what did you make of it? Look, look, first of all, no one's here to bag the referees. The bat referees do a fantastic job of what they do, and we praise them. Don't sugarcoat what you're about to okay, say. Okay, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I've, I've been lucky enough to play in the four grand finals. Yep. The emotions are higher, mm -hmm. all right? You come into the game fired up. You're ready to go. He, what did he do wrong here but say something? Like maybe get up or don't flop. Or to give him a tech foul at this time means he's probably going to sit down now. That's two fouls. And we know Roth doesn't play his guys after two fouls. You sit. So now he's sitting. Lee, Lee's not playing great. You, ha you hamper this team by doing that because you didn't have to do it. I don't think Melbourne United can complain if they didn't give him a technical foul on that. Do you think they can complain? Well, they don't. No, they don't, they don't complain. But in, in, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this guy, if you don't play, if he's not playing, he's not on the floor, then Melbourne United's going to win this thing easily. And fans don't want to see that. I'm with they want to see it. I'm with you, man. I'd love to disagree with you. 100%. Yeah. Actually, there's no need to call that tech. The initial foul, sure. Yep. yep. He runs into him and yep. he checks him and he knocks him down. Mm. But it's a championship series, man. Like, these guys are going to be up and about. You know, th th here we have a look at the foul again. Um, you can't do that. You can't just knock a guy down like that. Did he go down a little easily? I don't know. I don't want to get hit by Will Magne right. in that fashion. But, and you also, by the book, by the book, Copes, yeah. you can't do what he's doing here. You right. can't now go and stand over a guy and sure. quote, unquote, Taunt him. But sure. this is where the feel of the game comes 100%. in to the officiating. Go over to Magnate, pull him over to the side and say, listen, mate, that's not going to be how we're doing things. Yeah. Warning, no more taunting, so on. And then let's get on with the game. Grand final. Think about AFL. Do those guys, how they, when they come out. No, we don't want anyone banging and, mm. and throwing elbows. But the emotions are so high that you got to let something go. People in the stands want to see that kind of stuff. Hold on, let the hit go or let no, the tech let go? let the tech go. You can't give him a tech. I, I the couldn't hit. agree anymore. I huh? couldn't agree. 
The hit was bad, but not as bad. You the, 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 hit was, the hit was a foul, right? A foul. Absolutely. And I, he hit him pretty hard, so I don't even know what Magna actually was saying to He was telling him Bowen. to stand up. Well, well to be fair, he did just run straight through his but shoulder. He's clearly telling him that. Right? Well, what, after it all fair. happened... That's fair. After it all happened, I, they got together now, and they smiled. They, they were smiling uh, at each other. You know, you know what happens in this situation as well? Calls like that absolutely change the momentum of games and series, and that's exactly yep. what it did. Now, I, I still think Melbourne would have won that game. I do too. But in saying that, Will Magne going out allowed him to never get into any rhythm. Marcus Lee is just not playing good basketball right now. And, and Chris Levich, is, is, he works hard. We'll get to it a little bit later. But he's not the guy who's going to be able to stop JLA. I, again, I'm with Liam. I 100% would love to disagree with you. But if they're going to call, if they're going to call that, mm -hmm. we're going to see three or four tech fouls. We get down to Tassie. Look, the NBL as a whole yep. is continuing to push the verbals between Dean Vickerman and Scott Roth. 100%. You can't just sit there and go, well, hang on a second. Magne, Magne might have said, that's from the little eye. Mm -hmm. Well, hang on a second. We can't <laughs> sort of have both I'll players. tell you what else. I'll tell you, that, that was a big play. I'll tell you what was maybe even a bigger play mm -hmm. was that Ian Clark triple <laughs> to win the third quarter. Because yeah. they'd cut it to seven. Mm. It was ten. Sean McDonald has this look right here with six seconds to go. A good look yeah. to cut it back to seven and maybe give him a sniff. And then Clark does this from long range. Bang! And now it's a 13-point margin to start the fourth quarter. Of course, the first possession of the fourth quarter was that step back three in the corner against Magne, and now it's a 16 point margin. Imagine if McDonald hits that shot. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Clark does not hit that buzzer beater. It's a seven point game going into the fourth quarter. Maybe something could happen. Oh, that was the dagger. God. You said to me, we're sitting there watching the game. You said, was that the dagger? I said, like, yeah, yeah, I think it was. And it never looked like Missing the yeah. moment it left his hand. Let's let's stay with Ian Clark for a bit because mm. he, he's been on a championship team in both the NBA and the NBL. That famous uh, win a couple of years ago, ironically against Tasmania. He spent some time in Adelaide, but he has been somewhat underrated. When you've got a team as deep as Melbourne United, we sometimes talk about everyone else. Chris Golding deserves his flowers. Matthew Dallavar Dover. Shale is the best defender in the game. Travis JLA. We, we can keep going. <laughs> Ian Clark is a proven born winner. Mm. Who, and from where I sit, checks his ego perfectly. He doesn't really ever complain about not getting more shots or more playing time. And he just fits into this team perfectly. And when the game and a championship is there to be one coach, he just stands up and delivers. He was great again on Sunday. You can forget about him somehow, but he's going to burn you at some point. It's just something about the way he plays the game. He never, You're right, never complains. One of the best shooters in the league. Now, in the beginning of the season, I heard someone from Melbourne United say to watch him and Golden in practice compete against mm. each other mm. and have their little shooting uh, after the game. Golden making 9 out of 10, him making 9 out of 10, it just makes those guys so much better mm. as a combination. Now, who's, and when you got two guys that can shoot like that, and the way Delhi's been shooting the ball, Melbourne United are a better team. Ah, he's absolutely perfect for that team. Now, let's not forget, he's their only import. Yeah. We talk about how talented this team, they're doing it with one import. He's the Scotty Hobson yeah. of this Melbourne United team. Of course, they win the championship with Scotty coming off the bench mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. It's a very similar team to that squad. Joe Lawal's moved up one seat. He's now the Jock Landau spot. Ariel hook Porty is playing the role that he played as the backup big and, and Ian Clark playing that Scotty Hobson role to perfection. I got a question. Did Scotty Hobson wear number 21? Oh, I think he did. Is your number? Did, is Ian Clark wearing number 21? He is, yeah. Five, 21 is magical. <laughs> magical, bro. It's magical. Well, you told us off here that no one should be wearing it. No, I did oh, not. No, no. He called me and said, I want to wear it. I said, brother, put it on. The way I you am joking, but I'm not joking about this because Leonard Copeland said he doesn't want us to show the next graphic. But just graphic? roll it out the back. Let's have a little look at the all-time three-point main Ooh. buckets. Here's Chris Ooh. Golding. He's coming. He's, he's, coming. He, and he's, <laughs> he's coming quickly. Gazy Hill, really, Bruton, all superstars, as is our man Leonard Copeland. But CG, who went past Derek Rucker on Sunday, has most certainly not just a championship in his sights, Copes, but you at a top five spot. He's coming, man. Look, and records are made to be broken, and I'd, I'd be happy to sit there and watch him shoot it the way he shoots the ball. I've been a fan of him ever since he came into the league, so I want to see him. I want to see him. He probably won't Where do you get think days. he'll get to? I reckon he'll get past maybe CJ. I don't know if he can get really. No? But who knows? Who knows? Records are made to be broken. Mm -hmm. Let's get it done, bro. 
I'm right. with you, 100%. Yeah, well, it's not just three. the all-time three points, mate. It's also season as well. Check this out for Chris Golding. He's having a hell of a season, as we know. All-NBL first team. So that's in a season. Now, just quickly, just scanning very fast, all those other nine would be in a 48-minute game, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So... He's at 125. Where's he going to get to here? He'll go past Gazy. He'll go past Rucker. He'll go past really He'll go past Heel. I'm guessing he'll... I mean, that's, that's Heel's third... Season yeah, on the list. That is just true. He'll go <laughs> past Hill's third season yeah. at 129 because Rilly's a little higher as well. So I, I think he'll end up at a minimum six. It depends on how oh, far this goes. He'll go past any, Coach Sarah. Any well. chance he finishes number one? 23s the rest of the way across four games? Does it does it go to five games? I don't, I don't You know what? I don't think that's going to happen because Roth, Coach Roth's not going to let that happen. He knows. Well, hey, I'm, listen to me. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough to do. It is very tough to do, but uh, and I have no doubt Scott Roth. You, you think it's going to happen? Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but I do feel like we're, we've got a series here, fellas. Yeah, I, I think, mean, that Tassie yeah. team was a little tired. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Melbourne did nothing, but I'll oh, just take care of business in game one. The series doesn't really start, remember, mm. until a team either loses at home yeah. or we get to game 100%. five. Mm -hmm. And so I fully expect Tassie to go back home and take care of business, and we'll be back on Sunday to take it from there. There we go, championship series firing up. How does it win, loss, all the rest of it? We're going to break it all down. Game one and then into game two on the other side of this it is NBL Overtime. I wasn't even in my seat when this happened. Will Magnad, little air ball. The Melbourne fans loved it. They do occasionally have the roof open at John Kane Arena, but no win to be blamed for what happened on Sunday. So first it was Magnet, the crowd got involved, then of course Milton Doyle. This won't happen again. Surely. That one's a little bit short, but Shay Ellie, defensive player of the year, makes the superstar Doyle oh, double pump. Damn, come on, man. And then McVeigh, straight up, that's a little off to the left as well. You're coming for the jack jumpers, man. Well, I didn't you don't like you. Point this out. I didn't come up with this idea. The package oh, was stamped all the time. Ah, bro, you told us Jeez. off air you don't like the jack jumpers. I love Tasmania. Okay. I love it. I, I'm not done. Oh, no, I nearly threw a little joke in there about Dave Vickerman, but I won't. I, I love. Tasmania. I'm just pointing out right. that they had a couple of opportunities. They had a rough game. They did have a rough game. Okay. What are you had a good season? Oh, we know, this is going five. I don't shy okay. away from this. Okay, good. Melbourne won't lose back to back and they'll win a championship, but it's going five. All right, let's get into the centre spot because this is a big deal. And it's, mm. uh, it's headlined, of course, by JLA v Will Magne. Throw Marcus Lee in there. Have a look at that. Chris Levich playing some spot minutes as well. Hook Porty was outstanding. Have a look at the numbers 27, 18, four blocks compared to 15. 10 and 1. It was a domination really set from the start by JLA, but Magnate foul trouble. Lee, a little bit of injury, and Chris Levich just couldn't find any rhythm, Liam Santa Maria. Well, it's a huge battleground for the series, right? We can talk about Chris Golding, Milton Doyle. This, the the, the matchup at the four spot is, is interesting as well. But they dominated the five spot. They 100% did. And we've seen Will Magnate in particular can be a total game changer. Yep. But Joe Luala Chul set the tone early. Uh, he was aggressive. Now, some of it is the attack from the guards. If Illy and Delhi can get deep into the paint, they're going to set those guys up. But it were, they were aggressive. You know, when JLA's hanging on the rim and sticking his tongue out and staring down the front row, he can be a dominant force. And he just ha he wasn't that a lot of the time in that semi-final series. And we've been waiting. You called for him last week, Cam, mm. to step up and have a big impact in between he and Hook Porty, who was a plus 20 in 12 minutes or so. Yeah. They completely dominated the center position. And you know what? A lot of that is Dean Vickerman, too, because like you said, throughout the season, JLA wasn't great. He was still good, but he wasn't great. Mm -hmm. And every time he made a mistake or he did something wrong, Dean was snatching him out and having a word with him. Look, we need you to pick it up. We need you to pick it up. So I think he came out. He was, he was serious about this game, you could tell. And they both were because I think Hook Porty missed a couple of lobs and JLA went and put his arm around him and said, look, don't, don't worry. Mm. As long as we get our numbers out of this position, we're going to be fine. And they did that. What are you expecting on Friday night? Will Magnet has been really good. Marcus mm -hmm. Lee is carrying a little something but hasn't been anywhere near as effective. Will Magnet has been... Unbelievable. Do you expect him to bounce back? I was lucky enough to be in the stadium in Tasmania when he put on a show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a real show. Mm -hmm. I'm ex I don't know if it's going to be that good, 
but it would be a lot better than it was uh, on Sunday. Just for context as well, yeah. that was against Illawarra, and Sam Froling had a hell of a playoff run as well. Mm. So there was a tough matchup for him, and Magne dominated Froling the way that JLA couldn't do in that semi-final. So it, this is on Will Magne to play the type of again. We, we touch on Chris Golding Lamb, you know the the contagious sort of energy that he brings that everyone gets involved in. Will Magna has a little bit of that in yes, Tassie because of the way he plays above the Absolutely rim. Absolutely he does. You know, in that crowd, they, they, he, he really puffs his chest out and has a huge impact in front of that crowd. I, I think that team was a little tired. And Will Magna in particular. Mm. I mean, Melbourne closed out their series in Game 3 at home. They went to bed in their, to sleep in their own beds and they just got ready for that opening game of the series. Whereas... For Tassie, it was out in Perth. They had to travel back to Hobart. Then they had to, a day and a half in Hobart, make their way up to Melbourne. I, I, I mean, I'm not, it's not all that, right. but I just don't think they were at their best. Now they're going to have four or five days down in Tassie. In front, now they're going to be in front of their home crowd. I'm expecting a big bounce back game from that team, but Magna in particular. The, the, the difference between those two teams, nowhere near the score line in game one. No. Not and, not. and I think you know a little bit on it. Uh, Luke Travers. <sighs> outstanding mm -hmm. again on the weekend. Having a really good year. Of course, if you're a huge stats guy, it's a little more unique. May not necessarily be one that you've seen a great deal, but he was huge. He's as active defensively as he is offensively, and he's able to turn it around quickly going the other way. And that McVay-Travis matchup, Coach, is going to be really fun. Look at that. Bang. Stayed in the game, stayed in the contest, and was able to get it the other way. Winner of this goes a long way to the winning of a championship. You know what I like about Travis now? He's not hesitating on his threes. When that ball was kicked out, usually when he played in Perth, he'd either dribble it and pass it. Now he's knocking it down. He's consistent. So when you got that going, plus he's athletic. I keep saying he's a, he's a younger version of Sam McKinnon. Mm. He's athletic. He's physical. He's smart. There's no need for him to go out and score 30 points. He just gives what he gives, mm. and what he gives is good enough. Right across the box score. Yes. I've spent his entire NBL career waiting and pleading for this 5x5 five five game. Mm -hmm. Now, in a 40-minute game, it's, it's probably never going to happen. But nine points. What was it? Three rebounds? Two, two assists. Two steals. Four blocks. Six combined steals yep. and blocks. His impact. You've got to just move, look beyond the points you do. Yes, tally right. when you when you. But you're he doesn't need to score it off for them. He doesn't need to no, score. He doesn't. Right. But what he does do is everything else at a very high level. Mm. And uh, I think, yeah, his impact, everyone talking about Joe Lawal and, and Chris Golding and Ian Clark because they were the top scorers in that game, I think his impact in game one went a little underrated. All right, we've got a little guard play issue with Tasmania right now. Crawford having a, a tough time of it, Ooh. had a tough time of it on Sunday. And mm. to be honest, it's going to be hard to break out of it when you've got Della Vadova and Shea Ely shadowing you every move. Here is Jordan Crawford. Uh, who had a really good start to the years, your regular season, as you can see there, but he's down in all aspects. The field goal percentage dropping, you know, nearly 13% there. Uh, hasn't had a steal in the playoffs yet. I'll start with you, Liam. It, it, mm. It's a major concern when your guy, who has played good basketball to get you in this situation, yeah. hasn't played good postseason ball. Yeah, and it goes back a little bit further as well. So these last three games, all in single digits. The final game of the regular season against the Perth Wildcats, they won, but he had a donut. In that one. Now, this is a guy, as you can see right there, he averaged 17 points per game across the regular season. Yeah. He was there, you know, one of, he was a primary scorer in this league. So it's there. Yep. He can do it. He's done it at the pro level in high leagues for a number of years. He's just in a little bit of a slump right now. Yeah, well, now, and it, as you got, as you know, yeah. as a professional scorer, you have that from time to time. But when the damn wall breaks, the water flows. So that can happen here at any moment. He's just got to get himself going. And you know what helps break it? When you got a coach like Roth who says, I'm behind him 100%. Mm. He's going to still play. He's still going to, we still want, he's our man. Yeah. Now, when you got a coach saying that to you, you, you just got to get in the gym and get those shots mm. up yourself. It's all in his head right now. But like you say, once he knocks down one or two, let him knock down two in the first quarter. You'd expect a big game from him. A really good point. He has to play 30 minutes for them to win a championship. He has to be on the floor and he needs to get back to that type of form he was in early. Again, it's hard to do, but he's a very high-quality player. Now, they are good defensively, Melbourne United, but Crawford is a stud. I expect him to bounce back at some point, but they've, they've got to get to him. They've got to get him shots early. They've got to get him flowing early because if he gets to half-time and he's still sort of in that little rut, because it, it, it's, it's really do or die Friday night for Tasmania. I do expect him to do, 
and it'd be one all, but they, they don't want to leave one on the floor and all of a sudden they've got to win three straight. No, yeah. absolutely. Huge pressure on them and Massive. pressure on him for sure. The problem is, <laughs> it's, it's Shea Illy and Matthew Delavadova. Right, it's like tough. you get no rest and yeah. you go on against premium offensive players. But you can do it. Like Justin Robinson had a good game in that game three and put some points on the board. And, um, the, pro and the other problem is he likes to operate in the mid-range and it's the shot Melbourne want him to take and they want them all to take. Right. Come, we'll run you off the arc, get you into that space. We're gonna, we've got long bodies that are going to contest. So he's got to try to find some spots in transition and, and on the arc to try to get himself going. What, what if Magne and, and McVeigh are rolling? Mm -hmm. Say they're playing well. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes you have, to, you have to double down or and you give him those open opportunities to knock down those threes. That's mm -hmm. all it takes, man, to get yourself right. going True. if you've done it before. Let's also point out, even when they've won games, now they've, they've made the grand final series without him having a great deal of impact. So right. if they're able to get him going... You disagree? Oh, I don't. Yeah, no, you're bang on about yeah. that. You're suggesting, though, they can win this No, they can't win the championship no. without him playing better basketball. Uh, yeah. No doubt. But I also think that uh, the Magna McVay piece of it doesn't necessarily mean if they play better, he plays better. It's a yeah. little bit more on him. Now, just quickly some injuries. Because when you've got a five-game series and we're banged up and all the rest of it, we'll have a look at Marcus Lee just quickly. He stayed down for a little bit here. Uh, it's a little shoulder injury. He got up and he looked shook for a little while. He got mm. up. He hasn't exactly been anywhere near as effective as I think Scott Roth and the crew would like. They've changed mm. his role a bit. He started majority of the year, boys. Mm. He's clearly coming off the bench now with Will Magne. There was a suspension that um, he was at that game to a Perth. But we weird, do expect him it? to go and be yep. ready to go. Now, here's Daly. Now, it was sort of a little interesting one. He just came down just on... the bump. Yeah, no, he, his foot comes down on Milton oh, Doyle yeah. and it just goes yeah. over slightly. Now, he didn't come back on, but the game was done mm. by that particular point. So nothing suggests that he wouldn't, outside of the frustration here by Daly that he won't play and be ready to go in game two. And, of course, Kruzlovic, similar type of situation. Mm, looked worse. Yeah, it did. It looked, looked really horrible, actually, to be at the, the stadium at the time because he did stand down for a while... Mm before sort of being right. helped off without being carried. So he walked off on his own volition. So uh, we expect all those three guys to play, unless Olgan tells us otherwise on the other side of this coach. 100%. What you got to understand, though, yes. is it's, it's playoff time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys are going to be hurt. Grab it up. Well, Grab you up. played with a horrible ankle in Game 3 of the 92 Sydney Kings series. You went over in Sydney in Game 2. Do you remember this? Uh, man, his memories. Love it. You went over, and then you got beat. And then game three, you taped it up two days later. You knocked the Kings down and went to grand final series. Come remember? On, bro. Come on, I can bro. remember the shot. It was like a little 12, uh, how 12 old feet. Were, how old were you? I was 11. Eight, 12, 12 footer <laughs> right near the baseline. You stood at the baseline. I don't miss a thing. I got you, bro. But wow. Oh. Quick break. Olgan's going to join us there. <laughs>some fighting words in the press throughout oh, oh. the week because we know the moniker for the jack jumpers is defend the island and dean vickerman he came out and said i'm sick of it you can defend your little island all you want we are going to worry about us and those wherever you're from are fighting words yeah i think uh, i'm hoping that that was taken out of context by dean but it's it's quite disappointing to be quite honest with you um you know they they have two tasmanian families on their roster um tasmania seems to be the butt of every joke um, people want to punch down at that place. Um, and for me, uh, when I went down there, they said, you're not going to succeed down there. You're not going to be welcome down there. It's a different place. And my three years have been nothing but love from that whole community. Um, they've rallied around this team. And, you know, I was lucky enough to come up with Defend the Island. And really, that's the rallying cry, not for basketball, but really for the entire state to just be proud of what they're doing there. They're hardworking people down there. They deserve the best. And uh, I'm, I'm a little disappointed by that comment. You really amped it up towards game one, Scott Roth. We hit a disappointment there, Dean Vickerman, in the comments he made to our very own Olga Nulik, who joins us now. Hello to you, man. Hey, I feel, I feel conflicted that mm -hmm. I've started... All of this mess. <laughs> I thought you were going to say responsible, but either which way we'll, we'll move on. Take us just quickly into it because Scott speaks about was it out of context, in context. Talk us through the actual chat with Dean Vickerman that they that he got to that actual comment. Yeah. So my question to Dean at the time was what his thoughts were on the Melbourne versus the world narrative mm -hmm. that had started to creep up ahead of the series, right? Melbourne is the big market team. It's a Melbourne team. So whether mm -hmm. it's Melbourne or Sydney, everyone's going to barrack for the other team. And the other t team just so happened to be Tasmania, the mm -hmm. island state. And mm -hmm. I think everyone was gathering around them. And it was sort of like a playful banter from Dean Vickerman 
saying that you know he can talk about defending his little island, but we're going to go about our business and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it was banter. I appreciate that Scott Roth took it very personally because he has poured his heart and soul into mm -hmm. not just that franchise but that state, and so he cares very deeply for it. And, and I think it's clear that he's been using that ever since as sort of motivation for his team. Um, but it was it was playful banter. Uh -huh taken a little bit more seriously than perhaps and, it was delivered from Dean. And when Vico said it, you knew I've got my quote. As soon as he said it, I was, I was in the, there's a room that we hold, that United holds press conferences in, Benny Hopkins, the, the media manager was sort of in the corner fixing a camera. As soon as he heard the quote, he, just, he turned around, knowing exactly what had happened. Uh, they knew exactly what the aftermath might have been. I don't know if they knew that it would get to the sort of extent that it did with mm -hmm. the, the way that Roth was going to take it. But I think they knew it was going to cause some issues. I, don't, I don't, just don't think the NBL coaches have done enough to push it <laughs> in the last three or four days. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's brilliant. I think it's great for basketball. Uh, yeah. You need this kind of stuff. You need real rivalries. Yeah. And that's, that's what I think is happening here. Agreed. Even though Melbourne, even if Melbourne wins it, mm -hmm. they're always going to hate. You know, the Jack Jumpers, Jack Jumpers are always going to hate them. So, it's uh, good for basketball. Hey, this afternoon, uh, you did break to Christian Doolittle is going to stay at the Perth mm -hmm. Wildcats. Been confirmed by the Wildcats himself in the last half hour or so. Talk us through the deal. Yeah, it's a one-year deal for Doolittle to stay. This is These talks have been going on basically as soon as the Wildcats knew that Doolittle was a really good fit with Bryce Cotton and that team. I'm told that this was agreed to weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to wait until the season ended to announce it. And this they keep... Someone who I think really developed into a, a star of the NBL mm. um, and someone who I think is a star in his role mm. as well on this team. And that's really difficult to find imports who can be a connector and, and be a really good role players. I say role players, it's maybe diminishing him a little bit, mm -hmm. but really good fits next to Bryce Cotton yeah. and they get to lock him in for one more year. Mm. So just on the Perth Wildcats roster, let's have a little look at where it sits currently with the do little news breaking. Of course, John really the head coach still there, Bryce Cotton under contract. So Usher, Wagstaff and Zunik, the three guys mm. off contract. I want to ask you first about Jesse Wagstaff. Have you got a feeling either way if he's going to go again on this remarkable career he's put together? I mean, the sense that we're all getting is that he does have a desire to come back for at least one more year. And so when you look at that, that roster, you've got those two team options on the Webster brothers. I expect them right now, but the feel is that they'll pick up Ty, more than likely won't pick up Corey. And so when you look at that list right there, let's say Wagstaff comes in for that that Webster team option that I expect them not to pick up, they've got their entire roster full except for one import. So that's what it looks like the Wildcats are likely going into free agency with, unless they do a situation that they did a few seasons ago with Todd Blanchfield and, and Mitch Norton mm. maybe buying out a contract or something like that. But it looks like their, their roster is largely done going into free agency. It's pretty settled, yeah. I mean, they've got Dante Russo-Nance and Michael Harris. They had in their deals that it was on this year that they would both be elevated to fully contracted roster spots. So you don't expect Usher back. I don't expect Usher back. Okay, so then Wagstaff comes in, Corey Webster maybe, maybe not, and then we see what they do elsewhere. But Perth have a, a history of waiting mid-season and then bringing in somebody they need, if they need somebody, or cutting somebody. So, yeah, that roster's great now, but I th there'll be some more changes, you think, you have to think, wouldn't you? Well, just from an import point of view, you're yeah, talking about, yeah. right? Yeah, look, they had they have at different times tried to work their way through different things. They didn't do it this year, but mm. we shall see. Now, for people watching at home right now, they won't disagree when I say I'm a simple man. Normally, some <laughs> wow. people would call me stupid. Can you please tell me how Sam Meninga is already ended up at the New Zealand Breakers when he had a contract one week ago with the Cairns Taipans before free agency starts? This is as close to a trade okay. as, we've, as we've ever seen mm -hmm. in the NBL. Basically... Season ends, Sam Menenga has a desire to get out of his contract with the Cairns Taipans. You can have an agent sort of work the phones a little bit and the New Zealand Breakers express their interest in, in getting Sam Menenga on their roster. So then ultimately it becomes a conversation between the Breakers and the Taipans. And the Taipans practically said, if you buy out a portion of his contract, then we can waive... Uh, the fact that he has to wait until free agency opens and so you can sign, sign him immediately. So this was, Smart. in essence, Sam Menenga traded to the New Zealand Breakers for cash considerations. Smart move. Smart move. I think I'm clapping the New Zealand yeah. Breakers because yeah. that is brilliant. I didn't realise that was actually legal in an NBL sense, but they've done a brilliant job. They want their man. I think it fits perfectly for the team. I just didn't realise it was actually <laughs> available to be done. I mean, it's, it's literally just about being proactive. If yeah. you're a team and you see someone on another roster... You can just pack, go and ask that team, would you come off this player's contract if we buy him out? 
and then it's just an agreement between the two teams. If the Taipans say that, yeah, we'll allow Sam Manenga mm -hmm. to get off that contract and sign with you now, then they can just decide to do that. If all of those parties agree to it, that's the, I think that's the most functional way to make trades work. But I want cotton. I want cotton. I want cotton. No. <laughs> yeah, I Another team will have to want cotton, and Perth is going right. to have to say, sure, you <laughs> can have cotton. I think it's happening anytime soon. You got to think? Well, I, just, it's, I like it, the, the wheeling and dealing. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I mean, then we can talk about, well, Sam Meninga. Mm. Mm. How they obviously love him to want to, to buy out a big chunk of that, that second year of his contract and then sign him to a new deal. But he's a local guy, West Lake High School, is it? Yep. He can um, play. He can play. He can play. He's got a versatile oh, yeah. skill set and he's on the way up. So I like it. Yeah. Hey, Mojave King, a man we've known and a young man we've seen a couple of times, a couple of years in the league at Cairns and Adelaide. And there's some whispers getting around that their teams are trying to get him back. Where do we sit with Mojave? Yeah, this is something that we flagged on uh, the marketplace a few weeks ago yep. where, team, where Mojave King had a desire potentially to come to the NBL if he wasn't going to get a two-way contract. It seems like a two-way contract is maybe a bit further away for him. And so there are multiple teams who are interested in Mojave King. And when you look at the free agency class, it's not that strong in the sense that there aren't that many guys, especially in that position. And so someone like Mojave King, an, an athletic wing, theoretically a shooter, is the idea of a really good player. So someone like that becomes super valuable. Uh, and so there are multiple teams interested in his services. So if he comes into the league, it would be a little bit like the Luke Travis situation, right? Like Indiana Pacers would continue to own his NBA rights and he'd be trying to perform at a level to get picked back up. Right, so he got picked up by the Pacers, he's been playing for the Mad Ants in the NBA G League. This is effectively a stash whomever picks him up in the yeah. same way that, that Travis was, in the same way that Justin e. Jessup was when he first got here, he would practically be stashed here. All right, Jack White, Xavier Cooks, uh, Brock Modem, just talk briefly about three men we've seen before. High, very high profile players, where do they all sit? So Xavier Cooks, we are aware of the Sydney Kings' strong interest in bringing him back to the NBL. Brian Gorgian uh, was seen in the Philippines watching Cooks' cheaper Jets win the EAS EASL Championship. And so I don't think they've made a secret of their desire to bring him in. And so those talks remain ongoing. That's one that I think there's a better chance than not that that ends up happening. Mm. Uh, the Jack White one is interesting. There are, there are whispers of Luke Travis potentially finding his way to the NBA next season, potentially on a two-way deal with the Cavaliers. They have his, his draft rights. And so that's someone who I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. And United has an interest in Jack White and bringing him back into the fold. And it's basically a like-for-like -like swap. Jack White, he's been playing with the South Bay Lakers. Uh, he's... His three-point attempts have gone up, so I think he's a really good fit, obviously, especially if you just swap those two. Mm -hmm. And then Brock Modem is someone who has been playing in Europe, really high-level Australian, playing in Japan recently. He is uh, a desire to return back to the NBL. Now, this is a stronger desire than he's ever had toward the back end of his career. And so whether it's this season, I don't know, but I, he is flagged to teams that he wouldn't be against a potential return to the NBL for next is season. Is there a sense for Brock Modem about which team or teams might be initially interested? Not that I know of at the minute, uh, but from what I understand, he is open to, to all offers. Brisbane Bulldogs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ivan, as always, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Of course, nbl.com.au is where you can get the marketplace because the free agency and all that news starts to fire up now via the NBL app as well. The Hawks and the Wildcats on the NBL Overtime Agenda next. Glenn Santamarell and Art Copeland. Cam Luke, Championship Series is 1-0 Friday night. Tasmania is going to be rocking, already sold out. And then Melbourne back there on Sunday. But really going to park that just quickly and talk about the two teams whose season ended last Wednesday night. We'll start with the Perth Wildcats because they had home court advantage, mm. packed RAC Arena before a little short against a very good Tasmania team. We'll start with Bryce Cotton because 6 of 9 didn't get the shot attempts, the bulk shot attempts that we've seen over the course of his career, he couldn't really get in the rhythm. He looked frustrated at different mm. times. And the, mm. the body language that we haven't necessarily seen a great deal from Bryce Cotton. But in the end, Tasmania guarded him particularly well. They did. You know, and it's a, it's a shame the way things finished up for Perth. Because they did have a good season. They had a they tough did. start. They really turned it around emphatically to finish top two. And then they had home court advantage for that decisive game three. And I, I just think it's interesting the way it turned out. Where at the start of the season, so much of the conversation and about their struggles in losing games was was around getting Bryce the ball and getting it in the ball in scoring situations. And then they resolved that. And then in the end, they lose the, the series and their season ends 
on that same type of issue. Um, with Copes, the, the, the jack jumpers employing your approach of doubling Bryce every opportunity you can get, get the ball out of his hands and then keep it out of his hands. My thing on the call was get it back to Bryce yeah. so that he can get some more shots up. He had 21 points in that game, three Copes, but only had nine shots. Nine shots is not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, a superstar like that, he needs 20 to 25 shots. But we also spoke about this. He needed some help. Mm -hmm. Now, if you shut Cotton down, can the Perth Wildcats win by shutting Cotton? Can, can they win if you shut Cotton down? Is there somebody else that can score 20 to 25 points to carry this team? They got better through the year. Guys stepped up. Harris stepped up. Pender stepped up. One of the Webster boys stepped up. Doolittle stepped up, all right? But... Tasmania just did a great job of taking Cotton out of the game, and no one was able to be the leader of that team. But it felt like it should be Keanu Pinder, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's the high price guy that they got over from Cairns last year, and almost, I'm going to say, not every club, but the majority of clubs are after. We know how important the signature was. Mm -hmm. John Rilly, after we spoke about Keanu Pinder last week on this show, is what John Rilly had to say post game Wednesday night after the elimination game. Let me first address the Keanu Pinder situation. We have a qualified medical staff. I have my player's well-being at the highest of my list. When we have uneducated comments being made about something that happened, I would question whether those people really have the player's well-being at the forefront of their mind. Very disappointing. Disappointed, John, really. And those comments were aimed squarely at, at this particular show for what we spoke about last Tuesday night. So uh, let, let's sit here then and say he's 100% fine. He stunk it up. He stunk it up in a game three. And when you pay someone to the, the, <coughs> the amount of money you do, you need Keanu Pinder. When they guard Bryce Cotton so well, you need him to have a game like he did in game one and has had at different times in his NBL career. Well, Copes, you said that they need someone else to step up and score 20. And in game one, that, that was pinned. He had the 25, he hit the five threes. He was the difference in that game. And then we know what happened in game two. And, and then the weird thing for me was when he stepped out at the beginning of game three and didn't have his mask on. I found that strange because he'd worn it all season. We know about how, why he wears it, the orbital fracture that he's, he suffered and the risk he has moving forward. So, okay, he doesn't have it on to begin the game, and I found that strange. But then, at quarter time, he puts it on. And then, from you know, plays out the rest of the game with the mask on. So I, I don't know what was going on with regards to the mask, but what we do know is that after that 25-point performance, and after that moment in game two, halfway through the second quarter, where he had a moment that looked like he was unwell in some kind of way where he looked a little dizzy mm -hmm. and he then went off the floor and didn't play the rest of that second quarter his impact on the series completely disappeared have a look at the numbers for keanu pinder across the series the huge game in game one the weird game in game two and then his first donor since february 2021 in the decisive game three and John really spoke about having his players' interest, best interest at heart. He's supposed to. He's a head coach. Mm -hmm. Of course you do. We're not here to say you're, you're not doing that. We're just here to call it as we see it. And when you see a guy get hit, I played 530-plus games. When a guy gets hit in the head three or four times in a series, there's going to be some problems. I don't care what you say. So you, my, eyes oh. tell me, my eyes tell me this. I'm not saying you didn't get checked. Perhaps he did, he got checked, and say he's cleared, no problem. But he's still not 100%, because if he was, he wouldn't have been 0 for 7 and didn't score a point, 25 points in the first game, and zero points in the, that's not him, he's a player. From the conversations yeah. I had, I 100%, and, and, and what I believe they spoke to the league about, the 100% I felt and was told he was right to go. And I believe, I take okay. Perth 100% right. on their word, right. that he's 100% right to go. Mm. And he stunk it up. He did. And we, we, we've been on JLA, we've been on Crawford tonight, not playing. When you are a high-priced player and a star in this league, you've got to deliver. Yeah, and I mean, I, don't think, oh, I think you're being a little harsh on Keanu, and I'll tell you well, why. I'll tell you why. Oh, I don't think he was I don't 100%. Either. I don't either. 
There was something wasn't right with him. Something wasn't right. And that's as and as a result, he didn't have his best performances. Everything was set up for him to play really well because if they're doubling Cotton, then there's four on three at the back end. So you might catch it and get, you know, make a play to the rim or you've got offensive rebounding opportunities and he wasn't able to take advantage of that. I think he's a high-level guy who just for whatever reason from midway through that series on just wasn't right for whatever reason whatever reason is he got knocked now i'm not saying he wasn't Please they didn't don't. check they didn't check him they checked him he's they checked fine him. They he got him. knocked in the head a couple of times i'm up well, play this game well, we put this out they had conversations john really alluded to it in the press conference that they had conversations with the nbl so everyone who needed to be satisfied that he was okay to play good he was okay to play okay right so we, we, you know, you're what? not saying that he's you watched it. You saw it with your own eyes. You know what? I'm not you're not saying he's fine. I, well, Something I, wasn't right with him. But then, look, I understand what you're saying, right? But if the NBL come in over the top and have those conversations with Perth, in the end... Sure. And they have got his health and well-being at the top sure. of the agenda. Of course. In the end, he had to be in right to go or the NBL and the yes. Perth Wildcats well, I just, wouldn't have played I it. just hope he's OK. So, so do I. Because... Honestly, and, and John obviously says there about having the best interests of the player at heart... He'd, he's a much better player than that. Mm -hmm. He um, didn't perform at the level that he would want to in the types of big games that they were. So something is, was not right for him, and hopefully that he's okay moving forward. Let's go to Illawarra, because they had a hell of a season. It was almost a fairy tale season, pushing Melbourne United to Game 3. What a year for Illawarra, and they still remain within striking distance in the fourth quarter of Game 3 in Melbourne. They fall just a little bit short, but there's no doubt that the confidence, mm. the momentum, the positivity, the buy-in from the local fans is at an all-time high. And this is an exciting time, Coach, to be involved with the Illawarra Hawks. The best thing about it is the coach wants to bring the entire team back. Yeah. He wants a full year with him. And I'm, I'm with him because these guys are behind him. They listen to what he says. He says, when you got a guy like Clark and Frawling, they had a great combination at the four and five in this league. This guy went from zero minutes <laughs> to being a superstar. <laughs> a superstar. Okay. In, uh, am I wrong? He's not a superstar. He was great. He was, he was fantastic. Was great. You got to give him his love. Give uh, him, hey, we're giving him love. 100%. He played great. Let's not think superstar. Okay, I mean, he's not a superstar. You were, not... you were a superstar. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I'm a, okay. Yeah. Well, look, he played <laughs> <He's> great. <accepted. laughs> he played great. He though, did. He played great. He did. But the other guys did their jobs mm -hmm. as well. Robinson coming off the bench. There was no crying about that. You know, you got um, Harvey, who changed his game completely. Harvey was all about getting those shots up. Now he's passing the ball, getting guys involved. Mm -hmm. I love what they did. Give him a full year, see what the team can do, and you move on. All right, so let's have a look at their roster. Before you so, get any further, yeah. you right. know what I'm going to do? Right. It's not that I don't believe you, yeah. but I'm going to see what Justin Tatum actually did say okay. when it comes to keeping the roster what together. Here is the head coach. Yeah, for sure. We definitely want. I want everybody back on this team. You know, what I mean, I, I, I mean, but at the end of the day, we know this is a professional league. We gotta, you know, do our best to retain and give them back. But you know, GC and Sam, everybody knows. I, I want the same 12, 13 guys that was in there. Uh, but if that doesn't work out, you know, we, we we'll find a way to make it work. But that is our first priority. And here is the roster. How it mm -hmm. currently looks, Liam Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. who, who's not coming back, Sam? Okay. Well, Gary Clark's the one, right? Yeah. I mean, Tyler Harvey makes. I think it makes sense to bring him back, and then hey, keep working on the uh, the ability to naturalize him, and then slide him into a marquee player spot <laughs> as soon as you possibly can. But Gary Clark for me is the pivot point because he's, he. You want to talk about superstar? That's what he is. Mm. All league yep. level guy, and he could. You know, like Bryce Cotton is MVP of the league until he's not. But Gary Clark has the potential to be that kind of performer. So that's the big one for me. Wani Swakula Bullock is an interesting one. He has played an important defensive role for that team. He's been uh, racking up some championships over the course of three. <laughs> his journey was a starter on a championship winning team in Sydney. What does that look like for him in free agency? Can he get an interesting situation elsewhere? Or does he even want to come back? Do they come to the party? So they've got some work to do if they're going to try to bring that entire roster back. I just think that everybody should be so excited about this roster and about this club and about the surrounds. And we know they've had their financial difficulties for a lot of their NBL franchise career, which has you know, spawned the entire thing. But the fact is, this is exciting. Justin Tatum's the right guy. And you're talking to Tyler Harvey. You are right. The, the conversation was, if he's naturalised, yeah, bring him back. 
But all of a sudden, he became that high-level import again that he was when he first got to yes. Australia yeah. late in the year. So it's a different conversation now. All right, quick break. You ready for yes or no? I am ready. I have got the toughest question Liam Santa Maria has ever faced. Oh, it's no. next right here on NBL Overtime. Santa's watching, boys. You know what time it is. Hey, check out the peripheral vision from Rock here. Boom! The <laughs> Felix, good handles. Over the shoulder, Magic Johnson. Tragic Johnson, come on. Man. <laughs> hey, keep an eye on Dally on the bench here. He's really trying to signal on sports from life now, but he's got things in his hands. He's like, get rid of the towel. I got the water bottle. I'm trying to make my point. Oh, wow. Are you happy with that? Yeah, that was great. Where's the rest of them? No, no, that's, no, that's it. <laughs> well, this is only working. All right, before we get into the yes or no, then, is it, we're, we're going to joint yes or no. Okay. Uh, uh, I tweeted this the other day, right? Do we need out. to be shaking hands after every game in a five-game series? No. No. Thank you. Perfect. All right, you ready for this? Yes, yes. or no? Uh, Liam. Mm-hmm. Is, is this the tough one? No, it's not. I'm going to save the, the tough one for last. Okay. okay. Is Jack Vey closer to the Olympic team than Luke Travers? No. Should Trevor Gleeson be the coach of the new NBL franchise? Yes. He want a slip, slop, slap. Um, where are we? Would Brock, Brock Modem start at all 10 NBL teams? No. Is Jonah Bolden a starting centre on a title contending team in NBL 25? Yes. Ooh. Will Ooh. Illawarra make another grand final before Sydney does? No. All right, here we go. <coughs> oh, here we go. Has Chris Golding yeah. had a bigger impact mm. on the NBL than Leonard Copeland? Smoking crack. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yes, what did you just say? Nothing. nothing. What did you nothing. say? Nothing. <laughs> no. No? 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 Okay. Then you why are you even asking that question, bro? Come I want to know. I think... Gaze alley to Copeland? That's huge. Amazing. You talked about the, ser the, Amazing. the series, your memories. Absolutely. You're I, a walking, talking example I'm not the one of the, the impact. I'm saying that because I'm sitting here. <laughs> <and I'm pretty laughs> no, I got you, man. No, no, no. I got you. Yeah. No, I, I knew. And look, this is what I this no. is the notes. This is the notes I wrote. And I don't actually, I think about 50-50. Uh, Liam will say Copes because he's scared of Leonard. Oh, come, <laughs> come on, man. Now, hashtag NBL Overtime. I copped a bit of grief on Twitter last week yeah. for not getting to people's questions. Right. Next week, full segment, get them in. Hashtag NBL Overtime. See ya. Bye.